Hmm, I have some serious problems in my life right now. What does that say about my relationship with God? As we begin tonight, I want to tell you about something I was thinking about this week. Uh, a few days ago, there was a news report about a brawl breaking out in a Golden Corral restaurant in Pennsylvania. The news report had video with it, 40 or 50 people fighting, and they were throwing tables and chairs and high chairs. Man, what a mess. It seems they were serving steak and there were several people in line waiting their turn. When they finally brought the steak out, the person in the front of the line may have been being a little picky as to which piece he wanted. <laughs> this was raising the level of frustration for those behind. Uh, who were already frustrated. Then it seems that someone may have tried to cut in the line. And someone said something, and then something was said back, and bam, <laughs> a fight breaks out. Pretty soon, it's a melee involving dozens of people. Well, thankfully, no one was injured. Um, but as I watched the video, I found myself laughing at how silly this thing was. Uh, but then the Holy Spirit began to convict me about enjoying the spectacle. I asked a few pastors about what they thought of the event. Uh, like me, they initially laughed and then were saddened by the overarching implications. Uh, one of the pastors that I queried was Pastor Chuck Singleton, and uh, he said something interesting. He mentioned how he believes that everyone is on edge, and it's easy to go a few steps farther than you normally would because of the inner frustration. You know, I think there's so much going on right now. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of something called COVID fatigue. Uh, there are two working definitions for COVID fatigue. One is the physical tiredness some people who have had COVID experience. It, it feels like your battery is never fully charged and depletes faster than it used to. The second type of COVID fatigue is mental and emotional tiredness and frustration uh, that people feel because of the impact COVID has had on our daily lives. It has been relentless for two years now masks, social distancing, <laughs> look, singing happy birthday to make sure you washed your hands long enough, uh, hand sanitizer, toilet paper, food, can't go to school, can't go to work, have a Zoom meeting, uh, can't go to grandma's house, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to church, and in the midst of all of that changing information, uh, you should wear masks. Well, which masks? You don't need an N95 mask. Paper masks are okay. Well, masks don't help. Well, any mask is okay. Well, no, only N95 masks are okay. Constant COVID news every day. Tension is up. And then you add the issues of race and gender and sexuality and politics, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, progressives, everyone constantly going at each other. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all adding to the tension. Why, why, am, I, why am I talking about this? 
Because sometimes the only thing we need is a little bit of awareness. If we recognize we are a little on edge, it helps us to pull back when we're about to react in a way we would not normally react. So please, uh, don't neglect your quiet time, your prayer time, your Bible reading, and of course, your worship. They all make a difference. A while back, we were in John chapter 4, and we looked at John 4 as if it were a movie playing out before our eyes. John 9 is even more like that. There's multiple scenes, all part of the same story, and it starts with a problem that many people have with God. Disability. Yeah, the seeming randomness of it all. Uh, what seems to be unfair about it? People logically have questions about why, and I'll say it like this, if life were a card game, some people are seemingly dealt a terrible hand, while others are dealt great cards to play. Some born rich, some born poor, some born in the United States where prosperity and opportunity are available even to those most looked down upon and most neglected. Some are born in a place where they have a social structure and governmental system of rampant corruption that makes it virtually impossible to move from being a powerless beggar to becoming rich and influential. Some are born strong and healthy, and some born weaker, and some with disabilities, some born with full use of their bodies and minds. It's not fair, right? People then ask what are seemingly difficult questions. Why? Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to my son or my daughter? Whose fault is it? You know, we live in a time where these questions play out on the news every day. And there are no easy answers. Look at the issue of our southern border. And again, I'm not making a political statement here. These are just real problems that I don't have the answers for. And I think if we were honest as believers wanting to honor God in every area of our lives, you probably don't have the answers for it either. As many flaws as we have as a country and problems of fairness and equality, there are people literally dying to get here. Parents sending their children into a strange land, just hoping they get in, even if it's without them. So they line up at our border. Why? Because there's opportunity to do better here. Opportunity that we, you and I, were born into. The difference between me and them is the location of my birth. You know, in John chapter 9, the story starts out with seemingly a hard question. John chapter 9 verse 1. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The assumption here seems reasonable. There is a cause and effect for everything. The question is, who sinned? <laughs> you know, we make the same assumptions today when we see things that we perceive as bad happen to people. I wonder what they did to deserve that. It's a reasonable assumption, right? <laughs> but it's a shallow one. It's, it's a lazy one. Some of us, like the disciples, 
ask it because we've been taught that that's the way it works. When bad things happen, someone is to blame. Why? Because God only allows good things for good people, right? Right? Okay. The only reason bad things happen is because you did something to deserve it, right? <laughs> Look, the first part of that question that the disciples ask is really interesting because they ask, who sinned? And then their first question was, this man? <laughs> Now, now let's, let's look at that because the scripture tells us that he had been blind from birth. They were kind of asking about <laughs> preemptive punishment. <laughs> look, have, have you ever heard of a parent mistakenly disciplining their child um, and then finding out that the child didn't deserve it? And then they said, well, uh, you're going to do something tomorrow, so this counts for that. <laughs> the disciples are asking, uh, did God punish this man for something he was going to do in the future? Because obviously he's blind since birth, so he couldn't have done anything before that. Um, look, or is he being punished for something that his parents did? We look at pain and suffering in our world and, and we want to make sense of it. We want to explain it or understand it. The problem with the disciples' question is that they didn't go back far enough. Is sin to blame? Yes. Sin is always to blame for pain and suffering. Without sin, there would be no pain. There would be no suffering. If you've been around Loveland for any period of time, you've heard messages about sin, about its consequences. You've heard messages on why bad things happen to seemingly good people. We believe that the Bible explains it like this. There's three basic reasons for suffering. Uh, the third one is Christian suffering. <laughs> you suffer because of your faith. You stand on God's word, God's principles, and this world will punish you for it. Your coworker wants you to skate a little bit on the job. And, and I don't know, if, look, I learned that term when I was in the Navy and, and skate means that, that you're really not going to do the work that you're, you're looking for a way to, um, maybe look like you're working, but not actually work. So your, your coworker wants you to skate a little bit on the job. And he says, don't work so hard. You get paid the same uh, if you make six widgets or 10 widgets. See, but he doesn't know that you aren't just working for a paycheck, that you're also working as an expression of your faith, your love for God. You know, Colossians 3, 23 and 24, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. And not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And because of that, you walk humbly and you work hard and you do your best every day. And this angers those who want to just do enough to get by. And so then they talk about you. They talk behind your back. They don't want to work with you. And it hurts. It's frustrating. Your boss wants you to pad the bill a little for a client or a vendor. You know, just add a few dollars here and there. And you refuse to do it. And your boss is disappointed in you 
because you won't do what helps the whole team's sales numbers and it costs you a promotion. Your coworkers start to gossip about the new lady in the office and how she climbed the ladder so quickly. And you speak up and say, guys, we don't know that. It's not fair to assume the worst about her. And they start to call you Mr. Goody Two Shoes and they start to exclude you from other conversations. That's suffering for your faith. Now, that's considerably light persecution compared to what's happened in the past and, and what's coming. But that is Christian suffering. The second form of suffering is carnal suffering. Carnal means flesh. Flesh is both physical and soulish, e emotional. Um, our physical flesh has desires that will drive us to do the wrong things. And our emotional flesh, <laughs> our emotional flesh leads us to make bad decisions. See, this is the suffering we bring on ourselves by the choices we make. You know, we smoke all of our lives and we get lung cancer. We eat cheeseburgers and french fries every day and we get heart disease. See, that's carnal suffering. It comes as a result of submitting to our flesh. You know, we, we cheat on our wife or our husband and our relationship falls apart. And as a result, our children are hurt and won't speak to us. We steal from our job and get fired. See, these things bring on suffering, pain, carnal, fleshly suffering. The first form of suffering is common suffering. Uh, when Adam disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. What was once perfect, without flaw, became damaged and destined to die. When sin entered the world, in came disease, in came natural disasters, in came death. That's why Matthew 5 says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Living in this world will bring pain and suffering. There's brokenness all around us just because sin has corrupted everything. Now this man in John chapter 9, this man blind from birth is more than likely a victim of common suffering. We don't know everything about him, but we know what Jesus' answer was. Who sinned? This man or his parents? So Jesus blows their mind. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. This didn't just happen because of them. You see, it, it wasn't this man's sin, and it wasn't his parents' sin. It wasn't their parents' sin. See, you have to go... Uh, all the way back to Grandpa Adam. <laughs> but there is this hope that we all have in suffering. Here it is, that the works of God should be revealed. Whenever there's suffering, there's an opportunity to see God at work. Um, does God will suffering so that he can display his power? When we see starving children, did God will that to show his power? When we see a baby born with a birth defect, did God will that? <laughs> when someone you know is killed in a car accident or even dies from coronavirus, he doesn't have to. 
Suffering is here. It, it just shows up. It's now part of the natural order of things. We're often surprised by suffering when in reality, we really ought to be more surprised by not suffering. We've built a safe world and so now suffering surprises us. We have the illusion that we're in control, that we build houses to keep us safe and dry and warm. And so we expect to be safe and dry and warm, but then something natural happens, a, a hurricane, an earthquake, a flood, a fire. If you watch movies, <laughs> a zombie apocalypse or an asteroid. No matter how safe you try to make yourself, the opportunity is always present for suffering. But that's where God steps in. Suffering is a place where we can see God work. We get to see his mercy and grace and love and compassion. That in spite of the pain, in spite of suffering, we see God work. A child is born with a severe birth defect and he requires constant care and supervision. And for those on the outside, what a burden. But something often happens. The family begins to coalesce around this child. God fills the parents, family, and friends with love and grace to a level never before imagined in those people. What others look at as a burden has become a blessing. See, that's God at work. Look, but Jesus in this story doesn't stop there. He connects the issues of the man's blindness to the work that he came to do. Look at verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Jesus says right here, I came for this. I came to show you that I'm here for a poor, blind beggar. And the, in his statement, he's, he's obviously not talking about daytime, but expressing a window of time. Jesus knew the cross was coming. I need to show you what God is up to. Because the time when you can see it is almost over. The, the time for me to show you is going to end. But right now, then look at 9.5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Put it together. It's, it's right here. You have the blind man who has never known anything except darkness. Even up to this moment, darkness. He's right there in front of them. Who knows what he was feeling? Uh, who knows what he was thinking? And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But, but Jesus says within earshot of a man who only knows darkness, I am the light of the world. How amazing is that? How bold is that? How beautiful is that? You see, most of us move away from those who are disabled. We see them coming and we go to the other side of the street or, or we find a, a way to go around them or we walk right by them as if they're not even there. Why? Not because we're mean-spirited, but because we're uncomfortable and, and we don't know what to say and we're not sure how to act. And, and so in our discomfort, we just try to avoid the moment rather than do like Jesus did and step right into it. See, most people are like that. Our, our fear dictates our interaction or lack of. But Jesus doesn't move away. He moves toward the suffering. Those that don't fit the mold of our society, uh, when others move away, Jesus moves toward. In our effort to be Jesus followers, let's follow him toward 
those who may not be able to move toward us. I want to finish with a question. How do you measure your relationship with God? And by that I mean, do, do you use circumstances or happenings to determine if you and God are on good terms? Look, I'm healthy. My bills are paid. I have money in the bank. My spouse and I aren't fighting. The kids and or grandkids are healthy and, and moving in a positive direction. Um, God must be pleased with me. <laughs> Some people measure it just the exact opposite way and, and that if things are going bad and, and I got laid off from my job and, and I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills and I can't pay my mortgage, I can't pay my car note, uh, I got a diagnosis of cancer or my husband or wife is sick, one of my children are sick, some people say, well, then God must not be pleased with me. Or do you measure yourself by your obedience to what God's word says? The fruit of the spirit evident in your life and his peace in your heart. Now, next week, we're going to stay right here in chapter 9 and really dig into this story of the blind man. Please keep reading chapter 9 this week. I promise you it will bless you if you read chapter 9 a few times this week. We'll see you next time.